I'd like to call this hearing to order. Uh, this is the American Energy Initi Initiative hearing, and we've had eight hearings on, on, on the subject of the American Energy Initiative. We've examined many of the challenges and opportunities confronting America's producers and consumers of energy. I want to thank all of our witnesses today. We look forward to your testimony. There is not any question that we have many issues facing our country and none more important than energy, both on the transportation side and the production of electricity side, because the cost of energy goes a long way in determining how competitive we are in the global marketplace and creating jobs in America, these uh, jobs being created in other countries. The Obama administration and particularly President Obama has done a tremendous job when he's out there speaking about how he wants to support energy. He talks about speeding up the permit process. He talks about more drilling. He talks about the impact of regulations on jobs. And all of us agree with his statements, but the reality is that his administration, the departments, seem to be taking the exact opposite tact of what he's talking about. For example, there's been an air permit relating to drilling off the coast, coast of Alaska that's been sitting there five or six years and has not been issued yet. More and more regulations are coming out being proposed by EPA relating to coal, for example, the Utility Act. Uh, which is going to cost an additional $10 billion a year to produce energy. And that does not include the air transport rule, which would raise it up to $14 trillion a year. So it's one thing to say you want to produce more energy. It's something else when your administration <clears throat> is taking the exact opposite tact. And, and, and that is certainly true in the subject of our hearing today, which is the discussion draft of the North American Made Energy Security Act of 2011, which has been introduced by Mr. Lee Terry. Uh, th that application to obtain a presidential permit was applied for over three years ago, and we're still waiting on it. So at this time, I'm going to recognize the gentleman, Mr. Terry, to talk about his legislation. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your assistance and counsel on the North American Made Energy Security Act. Uh, simply stated, uh, this act is to put a time date on the administration to accomplish its review and issue their order. As you mentioned, it's been uh, with the State Department for three years. There's been an environmental impact study. Uh, and at the request of uh, many Nebraskans, a request for a second one that has been completed uh, and sent to the State Department. So at this point in time, we think all of the information has already been provided to the appropriate parties. And it's time that we have a decision. So. The North America Made Energy Security Act, or NAMES, uh, simply sets a date of November 1st for the administration, for the president, by presidential executive order, uh, to issue his yes or no approval of this pipeline. Once he signs that, then uh, the legal parameters fall in place for each state's to have to deal with, including my state of Nebraska. Uh, so this is rather a simple bill that just says, let's move on with this. Now, the impact of this is important to the United States. Obviously, the oil sands are an important product uh, for our independence from OPEC oil. It's a major source of fuel for us. So the issue is to get those oil sands to refineries across the nation the small independent ones in the Midwest, whether it's Kansas, Oklahoma, or the bigger ones in southern Texas, which is the end of this pipeline. Uh, that will help the, our constituents when they go to the pump if we have more of that source and refined here domestically. Uh, it will create jobs in every state it goes through, including Nebraska, good, high-paying union jobs. So I want to thank uh, the chairman for uh, assisting and counseling. I want to thank Mr. Ross and 
Mr. Green for making this a bipartisan bill and the others on this committee that have joined me in this process. And by the way, uh, Mr. Chairman, we will file this bill when we go vote this afternoon. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Terry. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for a five-minute opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, all of our guests uh, for being here today. Today, we are holding a hearing on the North American Made Energy Security Act of 2011 which will require the Secretary of Energy to coordinate all of the federal agencies in charge of issuing a final decision on the Keystone XL pipeline in an expeditious manner. On the surface, this proposal seems reasonable enough, requiring the Obama administration to quickly come to a decision on whether it would grant approval for of the Keystone XL pipeline, which will bring additional Canadian crude oil into U.S. markets and help replace the supply of oil that we import from the Middle East and from other overseas countries. If this issue was really that simple, then it wouldn't take an act of Congress, Mr. Chairman, to make it happen. And we wouldn't be here today holding a hearing on this bill in this committee at this time. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, today I'll hold judgment on whether or not I can support this bill because there are some important issues that deserve greater examination. And I'm pleased that we're holding this hearing in order to bring some of these issues to light. This bill would force the administration to issue the presidential permit for the pipeline within 30 days of the final environmental impact statement and no later than November 1, 2011. This arbitrary type timeline will reduce the allotted time that federal agencies will have to determine the national interest in deciding this proposal by almost two-thirds, while also reducing or eliminating the 30-day public comment period. And I, for one, have some very serious concerns about this. I believe public input is a vital and necessary part of the determination process, especially for local communities that will most be affected by the decision to move forward. I also look forward to learning more about the environmental impact of importing crude oil from Western Canadian oil sands and how this would affect greenhouse gas emissions. However, Mr. Chairman, my biggest concern I have today is what type of impact this pipeline will have on oil prices for my very own constituents in Chicago, in Illinois, and in the Midwest in general. According to the AAA's fuel gauge report, Mr. Chairman, in Chicago, we are already paying the highest average gas prices in the nation at $4.37 cents a gallon which is well above the national average. And Mr. Chairman, I might add that yesterday I filled the tank, the tank up and it was 515 that I had to pay. I have here an AP article dated January 25th when TransCanada Corporation, the sponsor of the Keystone Pipeline, stated that they expected oil prices in the Midwest to rise if this pipeline is approved. In fact, I also have part of the Trans-Canada Assessment as well as the transcript before the, the Canadian Energy Board, uh, the NEB, in which Trans-Canada testified that the Keystone Pipeline would drive up the price of crude 
for many Midwestern states, including Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Ohio, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. Trans-Canada representatives are on the record saying that Keystone XL will address what they term an oversupply Midwest market, which they believe has resulted in price discounting for Canadian heavy crude oil. Building this pipeline will divert supply from the Midwest to the Gulf Coast, and I quote, Mr. Chairman, the resultant in increase in the price of heavy crude is estimated to provide an increase in annual revenue to the Canadian producing industry in 2013 of 2 billion to 3.9 million U.S. dollars. Now, Mr. Chairman, as fun as I am of our friends in the North, I would much rather keep that to the 3.9 billion dollars in the pockets of our constituents in the Midwest rather than giving it to our close friends, our deeply held friends in Canada. I look forward to this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, uh, our Mr. Upton is not here this afternoon. Is there anyone on our side that would like to claim his five minutes? Recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd take a minute or two here uh, of the time just to say, look, we've got a heck of a problem in this country with access to enough affordable uh, oil and gas. And it seems to me that if we could build the Trans-Alaska Pipeline in a matter of a couple of years as a result of an act of Congress to expedite its construction and produce and bring to the lower 48 uh, through Valdez uh, incredible amounts of, of oil, uh, we should be doing this as well and working with our best trading partner in the world, Canada, to get this done. It will create jobs mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, it will bring uh, 700,000 barrels per day of crude oil to the United States. Uh, I, I, for the life of me, can't understand how adding to supply and by some economist model drives up cost. I always thought it was the other way around. If you add supply, you drive down costs. And I still am a firm believer in that uh, value of economics. And so from, if we're going to ever get more energy independent in the United States for our transportation fleet, while we work on other forms of energy for transportation, we still need more oil and gas. We still need the ability to access America's great reserves and those of our neighbors and do so in the most efficient way possible. And that's why I support this legislation, because I think this will help out. With that, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if there are others on our side uh, that I could yield to Mr. Scalise for such time as he may consume. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. appreciate the uh, ability for us to hear the testimony from our panelists. I'm looking forward to hearing it. I know as we have been promoting ideas to lower gas prices and create jobs, uh, the, the, the sad reality is it's this administration's policies uh, that have actually been running thousands of energy jobs out of our country and leading to dramatically higher prices for energy. Uh, you know, it was the president himself who said just two years ago that he would prefer a gradual adjustment to near $4 a gallon gasoline. That was the president's comments. I'm s sad to say the president's gotten his wish because now we are near or at $4 a gallon gasoline. It was his own energy secretary who sat before our committee just a few weeks ago couldn't even articulate an answer to, uh, to Congressman Gardner's question about what's the president's plan to lower gas prices. The Secretary of Energy, the President's Secretary, said somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. Again, they're getting their wish. Uh, but they're doing it at the expense of families all across this country who are paying dramatically higher for gas prices today, more than double what the price was when President Obama took office. Uh, so we have seen an assault on American energy by this administration, and it's coming at a steep Obama premium, as I, as I call it, at the, at the pump. And people are fed up with it, and I'm glad that at least this House Republican Congress has taken action to reverse that trend, to say, let's become more energy secure. And, and of course, in Canada, our biggest trading partner with, uh, for oil, our, our biggest importer of oil, and, you know, frankly, I want to see us completely eliminate our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. And we can do that if we increase production here at home and work with our partner in Canada to, to instead of 
having their energy go to places like China to keep that here. And this pipeline represents billions of dollars of investment, up to $13 billion. I'm reading the testimony from one of our panelists today, $13 billion of private investment associated with the Keystone Pipeline, not to mention thousands more high-paying jobs that will occur in America if we do this. So we reduce our dependency on Middle Eastern oil, we create more jobs here at home, and we lower the price of gasoline because we're increasing the supply. And in the futures markets, we'll recognize once you untap that potential, uh, you will lower the price. And, and again, maybe the president won't be happy with that because the president's comments are very clear. The president said, like I said, in 2008, he, wa he would prefer a gradual adjustment to near $4 a gallon gasoline. Well, guess what? The price of gasoline back then when he made those comments was less than $2 a gallon. So while the president's getting his wish on raising gas prices and the wish of his energy secretary, Americans are fed up with the premium that we're paying at the pump. And we can do something about it. And here's one good example where we can create great jobs here at home and reduce our dependence on Middle Eastern oil at the same time. I hope the administration uh, doesn't continue to promote failed policies that are costing us jobs and leading to higher prices at the pump. And I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we're holding a hearing on legislation to short circuit an ongoing decision-making process and pressure the Department of State into approving a massive new oil pipeline called Keystone XL, which would carry a sludge made from tar sands through the middle of America. This project would raise gas prices, endanger water supplies, and increase carbon emissions. What's good for oil companies is not always good for America, and that's especially true of this proposal. True energy security means reducing our oil dependence and moving to cleaner, safer domestic energy. That's not tar sands. Canadian producers must burn vast quantities of natural gas to extract tar sands sludge and then use a lot more energy to process it into something approximating conventional crude. On a life cycle basis, tar sands may emit almost 40 percent more carbon pollution than conventional fuel. That's why this project is such a big step backwards environmentally. Some will say we have to make trade-offs and sacrifice our air quality for lower gas prices. But with this project, we would be sacrificing our air quality for higher gas prices. And you don't have to take my word for it. That is what TransCanada told the Canadian government in its official permit application. TransCanada said that the pipeline will address oversupplies of crude in the Midwest, which produce, quote, price discounting, end quote. Reducing those supplies by moving crude to the Gulf means higher prices for Canadian crude producers and higher gas prices for Midwestern consumers. As a result, TransCanada stated that the pipeline would raise prices for Canadian tar sands by $2 to $4 in 2013. In my view, this makes Keystone XL a lose-lose proposition for America. There is an ongoing process at the State Department for evaluating the pros and cons of the pipeline. The administration has not come down one way or the other. So it's interesting that they're being criticized even if they haven't done anything. That process should be allowed to proceed. But that is not what the legislation we are considering does. It takes the extraordinary step of interfering in the ongoing State Department review, and it pressures the State Department to approve the project on an expedited time frame. Congress should not be playing this role. The State Department should evaluate the proposal on its merits, not be ramroded by Congress into approving a boondoggle for the oil industry. One question that has arisen about the project is how it would affect Koch Industries, a largely private-held oil company run by the Koch brothers. According to press accounts, Koch would be one of the big winners if the pipeline is approved. My staff contacted Coke last week to learn more about its investments in tar sands. Other oil companies, such as ConocoPhillips and Shell, have been willing to discuss their interest in developing tar sands.
but Koch refused to answer basic questions. The company's representative told my staff that Koch is not an investor in the Keystone XL pipeline and has not taken a public position on the, on the project. But the representatives would not discuss whether Koch would export oil from Canada through the new pipeline, whether Koch holds tar sands leases, or whether Koch has plans to produce oil from tar sands. I think these are legitimate questions. Koch is a large political donor and major backer of the Tea Party. Members and the public are entitled to know whether the company would be a prime beneficiary of this legislation. Last week, I wrote to Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield to seek their assistance in getting answers. Today, I learned that they will not make any inquiries. If their objection is that Koch should not be singled out by the committee, I have no objection to asking other companies about their interest in tar stands. What I do object is to protecting Koch from legitimate scrutiny. This, and I will continue to discuss this with the chairman. This pipeline and the legislation that supports it will enable the oil companies to charge American consumers more for their gasoline while increasing carbon pollution and endangering precious water supplies. We know who will lose. We also need to find out who will benefit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and uh, once again, uh, welcome the witnesses today. We have one panel of witnesses, and we do look forward to your testimony. We have with us uh, uh, Mr. Dan McFadden, who is chairman of the Alberta Energy Resources Conservation Board. We have Mr. James Burkhardt, who's managing director of Global Oil, uh, IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates. We have Mr. Alex uh, Porby, President of Energy and Oil Pipelines, TransCanada. We have Mr. Jeremy Simons, is it Simons? Simons, Senior Vice President, Conservation and Education, National Wildlife Federation. We have Mr. Murray Smith, President of the Murray Smith and Associates. And we have Mr. Stephen Kelly, who is the Assistant General President of the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters. Uh, all of you will be recognized for five minutes for your opening statements, following which we will be asking you questions. I would note that there is a little instrument on the table there. It has red and yellow and green lights. And when it gets to red, we'd appreciate if you'd think about concluding your remarks at that point. Uh, so uh, Mr. McFadden will uh, recognize you for your opening statement. And be sure and turn your microphone on. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you about Alberta's comprehensive regulatory regime with respect to oil sands development. Alberta's oil sands are being developed under a rigorous and transparent regulatory framework that is based on the application of sound science and continuous improvement. Our integrated and comprehensive regulatory regime is founded on stringent legislation and regulation that takes into account environmental, social, and economic impacts, as well as resource conservation and technical excellence. Or to put it another way, the regulatory regime is designed to ensure oil sands are developed in the public interest. Implementing this regulatory regime is the responsibility of three regulatory agencies, the Energy Resources Conservation Board, the Alberta Department of Environment, and the Alberta Department of Sustainable Resource Development. The RCB is arm's length, a quasi-judicial independent decision maker established through legislation 73 years ago by the Alberta government. The government of Alberta created the RCB to ensure that the discovery, development and delivery of Alberta's energy resources takes place in a manner that is fair, responsible and in the public interest. The RCB directly administers seven provincial acts which ensure that all aspects of oil and gas development are carried out in a responsible manner. The board is responsible for setting down detailed regulatory requirements through regulations and directives. We have a budget of about $175 million annually and about 900 staff working in 13 locations across Alberta. About one third of our staff members are licensed professionals including engineers, geologists and environmental scientists. About 100 of our staff in our offices in Calgary and Fort McMurray are focused strictly on the oil sands. With bitumen reserves of 170 billion barrels, we have a responsibility to ensure the oil signs are developed in a sustainable way. 
Every oil sands project is subjected to regulatory scrutiny throughout its life cycle, from authorization and operational compliance to end of life closure. No oil sands project in Alberta may proceed without an approval from the RCB. On every application we examine, we look at three criteria to determine if a project is in the public interest. Environmental protection, societal impacts, and economic impacts. On particularly complex or contentious projects, a formal hearing by an ERCB board panel may be uh, established. The hearings allow for those that may be directly and adversely affected by a development to present evidence related to their concerns and cross-examine the project proponent before a board panel. Some applications for all sands mining developments result in a joint federal and provincial review. A formal decision is issued which sets additional conditions that must be met in addition to the rigorous requirements set out in our legislation, regulation and directives. But as noted in my reg introduction, our regulatory regime is not static. It is based on continuous learning and continuous improvement. I'd like to highlight two important advances we've made in well sands regulation over the last two years. In 2009, we released Directive 73 aimed at formalizing our oil sands inspection process. Directive 73 consolidated ERCB regulatory requirements and expectations that operators of oil sands, mining and processing plant operations must follow as well as setting out the expectations of ERC field inspections. This directive has greatly improved our industry's ability to ensure compliance with our regulatory requirements. Last year, our Fort McMurray field staff conducted about 120 detailed mine inspections. We've also conducted more than 10,000 inspections of in situ facilities over the last four years. The second major advance I would like to speak about involves tailings management. Every oil sands mine requires a tailings pond of one kind or another. Over the past decade, it became apparent we needed tighter regulations to hold industry accountable for improving tailings management performance. So in February 2009, we released Directive 74. It set out performance-based requirements for companies to reduce the amount of fine particles in tailings and place larger particles in areas where they can be returned to a solid surface more quickly. The ERCB has now approved plans for all eight mining projects. We estimate the directive has resulted in a commitment to some $4 billion in new technology, infrastructure and upgrades to tailing management facilities to meet the directive. One of the unforeseen outcomes of the directive was the emergence of an industry consortium on research. Seven oil sands companies have signed a groundbreaking agreement to share their knowledge and resources to find joint solutions to close and reclaim tailings ponds. Our regulatory partners are also committed to continuous improvement. As part of its adaptive management approach, the Government of Alberta has implemented the land use framework to bring about a cumulative effects management system across Alberta. The Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, or LARP, specifically focuses on where oil sands development occurs. To guide future decisions about oil sands development, LARP will establish social, economic and environmental outcomes and set limits and thresholds for regulated and non-regulated activities. This is an innovative approach to manage that will ensure Albertans' values are upheld regarding resource development and the environment. At the end of the day, the goal of all the work of the ERCB and our regulatory partners to ensure that our regular system is comprehensive, fully integrated, responsive, utilizes strong results based on science, and is continually improving. We are working to create a legacy for future generations and a stable and environmentally responsible energy source. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McFadden. And Mr. Burkhardt, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Whitfield and other members of the uh, subcommittee for the opportunity to uh, discuss today the role of uh, Canadian oil supply in the U.S. market. Uh, Libya, before the Civil War, exported about 1.2 million barrels per day. And since, <clears throat> excuse me, since the Civil War, exports obviously have halted. The price of crude oil is up about $19 per barrel on average since the Civil War. That translates into a gasoline price increase of about 45 cents per gallon. The amount of oil we get from the oil sands, the United States imports from uh, Canada in the form of oil sands, is equivalent to the amount of oil that Libya exported before uh, the Civil War, just to help provide some... Uh, context. Today is obviously a very timely opportunity to discuss this issue, the impact of high prices on the economy and, um, and the American people is creating uh, deep concerns. There's potentially momentous change in the Middle East 
and we are still seeing rising demand, in some cases very strong demand growth in emerging markets for oil. But in the realm of U.S. energy security, one of the biggest achievements in the past decade has been the growing role of Canadian oil supply in the U.S. market. And it's connected by land-based uh, pipelines, not waterborne imports. Last year in 2010, <clears throat> we imported about 2 million barrels per day of Canadian crude oil. That, was, that made Canada the number one foreign source for oil by far. That's about 22% of U.S. crude oil imports last year were from Canada, up from 15% just a decade earlier. What's been driving this growth? It's the growth in the Canadian oil sands, which is a mega resource that's right next door, right next door to the U.S. Without the oil sands, we would be faced with a, a tighter oil market and higher prices. The oil sands are also relatively new, at least in the context of the, of the oil industry. In the 1970s, there were no imports of oil sands. But by 2010, the oil sands alone were equivalent to what we imported from our number two source of supply, Mexico. And the oil sands are poised to become the largest single source of American uh, oil, at least from foreign sources, in the very near future. Now, this story, the oil sands story, is part of a broader relationship with Canada. Trade, jobs, energy, oil in particular are part of are the interconnected pillars of the U.S. and Canadian relationship. Last year saw $525 billion in trade between the two countries. Canada is the largest export market for the United States. Very dense network of trade and investment between the two countries. And trade with Canada is, um, is what 8 million jobs depend on in the United States. The multi-billion dollar Keystone XL project is also among uh, the largest projects in this country that could start construction in short order. And the oil sands, the Canadian oil sands could play an even bigger role in the U.S. market, which would benefit consumers. Pipeline infrastructure in this country needs to catch up with trends in oil supply growth. The growth in, 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 uh, out of Canada has been strong. It could continue to be strong. And we're also seeing strong supply growth in the northern Midwest, North Dakota and Montana. Oil production in, those, in that area, namely the Bakken Formation, could double over the next five to six years. Some of that oil would also find its way in the Keystone XL pipeline if it is uh, approved. So the Canadian oil sands uh, could play a bigger role, but they lack greater access uh, to the market, which is currently depriving the broader U.S. market with oil that is available from both uh, Canada and the United States. And a more flexible, robust supply system would be better able to handle shifts in supply and demand. It would not result in higher gasoline prices, uh, certainly not in the Midwest. The more supply there is in the global oil market, the lower prices are for a given level of demand. Midwest gasoline prices are already comparable to the national average. In fact, year to date, they're slightly higher. And why is that? The reason for that is the Midwest must import up to 500,000 barrels per day of gasoline from other parts of the United States, which means they're connected to the global price of gasoline. They need to pay that price, or else sellers of that gasoline would ship their, uh, their, uh, uh, their gasoline elsewhere. So the U.S., the Midwest gasoline market is connected to the global oil market, but there is currently a disconnect in the crude oil market uh, in the Midwest. And if expansion is not enabled, if the pipeline system is not able to expand to become more robust, Asia is certainly uh, an alternative. In terms of GHG emissions, uh, we calculate through a, a meta-analysis, we looked at 13 different studies, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for the oil sands are about 6% higher than the average crude oil consumed in the United States, 6% higher. So just to conclude, uh, a fact-based discussion and informed dialogue will help Americans and Canadians achieve a balance to enhance mutual prosperity. Just some key fundamental facts to review. The oil sands are a mega resource right next door. The oil sands have made Canada the number one supplier by far. Growth in Canadian oil supply to the U.S. is reorienting imports and enhancing energy security through land-based connections. But the U.S. pipeline system needs to catch up with these changes in supply. 
a larger, more dynamic system would benefit consumers compared with a constricted and more limited system. And again, life cycle GHG emissions from Canadian oil sands are 6% higher when you look at what's actually imported this country. So energy and oil in particular are a key element in the overall relationship. Canada's oil sands are an integral part of the fabric of U.S. energy security, security with the potential to play an increasingly important role in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Porby. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alex Porby, and I'm President, Energy and Oil Pipelines for TransCanada. Do you have your microphone? Uh, just closer. Oh. There you go. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> Uh, as I said, my name is Alex Porbe. I'm president of Energy and Oil Pipelines for TransCanada. Uh, in that role, I'm responsible for TransCanada's uh, oil pipeline business, as well as our company's power business and our unregulated gas storage business. Uh, before I discuss the specifics of the Keystone Project, I thought I would give the committee a brief overview of our company. TransCanada is a $46 billion energy infrastructure company with over 60 years of experience in the responsible development and reliable operation of North American energy infrastructure. At this time, the company employs over 4,200 employees, with almost half of those employees located in the United States. We operate the largest pipeline, gas pipeline network in North America, over 35,000 miles, with the capacity to transport approximately 20% of the gas produced in North America every day. And now with the Keystone Pipeline system, TransCanada is developing one of North America's largest oil delivery systems. Keystone will bring many benefits to the United States, but I believe the most important role Keystone will play is to help bring more energy security to the United States during a very volatile period recently. I think when you boil down the debate on this project, it comes down to a very simple question for Americans. Do they want secure, stable oil from a friendly neighbor in Canada, or do they want to continue importing even more high-priced foreign oil from volatile regions such as Venezuela or the Middle East? Keystone XL will help secure that stable supply of oil by linking Canadian and U.S. crude supplies with the largest refining markets in the United States. Canada's oil reserves are vast, approximately 175 billion barrels are estimated to be recoverable. This compares to the U.S. reserves, which are estimated to be around 20 billion barrels. In addition to energy security, our project will also create valuable jobs for Americans. 20,000 high-paying jobs and 118,000 person years of employment in spin-off jobs in communities along the pipeline route. Keystone is expected to inject $20 billion into the U.S. economy, and the project will pay over a half billion dollars in taxes to the individual states along the pipeline route during construction. While transporting oil from Canada, Keystone XL will also ship domestic U.S. crude oil. Keystone XL has the capacity to move 100,000 barrels a day of American pr crude production from North Dakota and Montana to Cushing, Oklahoma or the Gulf Coast and a further 150,000 barrels a day of capacity to move Cushing oil to the Gulf Coast. The need for prompt approval of the Keystone XL project is particularly cr crucial today when U.S. consumers are struggling to cope with a high cost of gasoline, something that impacts the pocketbooks of everyone. Specifically, the Keystone XL project has a capability to replace nearly half the volume of higher-priced Middle East oil presently consumed by the United States. A recent Department of Energy study found that the delivery of Western Canadian crude oil to U.S. Gulf Coast refineries by Keystone would fill a gap being created by declining supply from traditional heavy crude suppliers such as Mexico and Venezuela. The supply further projected that if Keystone XL was not built, more oil would be shipped by foreign countries to the U.S., primarily from the Middle East, to fill that gap. I would like to take a moment to talk about pipeline safety. Keystone's opponents have attempted to characterize oil pipelines as unsafe and dangerous. These allegations are untrue. Keystone XL will be safe. We are using the latest technologies and the strongest steel pipe from American and Canadian mills to build a pipeline. It was designed, built, and will operate in excess of the present regulatory standards. In addition, it will be monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 16,000 data points along the entire route of the pipeline 
are linked to satellites with data being refreshed every five seconds. If we detect a drop in pressure, our control center will remotely close valves, isolating the line and shutting it down within minutes. TransCanada has also agreed to implement 57 additional conditions developed by our regulator that go beyond the existing federal standards, such as increased inspections and more shutdown valves in sensitive locations. I want to emphasize that the Keystone XL project has already gone undergone a thorough and comprehensive review process. We submitted our presidential permit close to 33 months ago. Since 2008, we have held over 90 open houses and public meetings along the pipeline route. We have given hundreds of hours of testimony to local, state and federal officials and submitted thousands of pages of information to government agencies in response to questions. Before I conclude, I would like to address misinformation that has been reported in the media on the oil the Keystone XL pipeline will transport. The bottom line is very simple. Oil is oil. The heavy oil transported in the Keystone pipeline system is very similar in chemical properties and physical characteristics to heavy oil from California, Venezuela and Mexico that is transported daily throughout the United States and consumed in refineries. It is completely false to say that this oil is heated or that it is more toxic, corrosive or shipped at a higher pressure than any other similar crude oil transported or consumed in the United States. Our opponents have gone so far as to describe the oil we transport as tar sludge and I can tell you that this oil is like any other oil that is consumed in U.S. refineries. To the people who make these allegations about corrosive and dangerous oil, I would, I would respond by saying, why would we build a $13 billion oil pipeline that will operate for decades and then turn around and put a product in that pipeline that would harm it or destroy it? That does not make any sense. In conclusion, Keystone will help reduce the United States' reliance on higher priced, unstable foreign oil from Venezuela and the Middle East and replace it with secure supplies from Canada and the U.S. We're going to create 20,000 American jobs at a time when unemployment remains high and we will inject $20 billion into the U.S. economy and pay billions in taxes for decades to come so communities can build schools and ball fields. This project is needed, the benefits are clear, but time is of the essence to receive the approvals we need so Americans can begin to experience the benefits of this project. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simons. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Jeremy Simons. I am Senior Vice President for Conservation and Education at National Wildlife Federation, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization supported by 47 state affiliates and 4 million conservationists around, throughout America. Uh, before I start, I'd like to take a moment and offer my condolences to Randy Thompson and his uh, family. Uh, Randy's family has a farm in uh, Nebraska, and he wanted to be here today. Um, to uh, share his experience with TransCanada, bullying them uh, as they try to gobble up land for their uh, pipeline route. But unfortunately, uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, his mom passed away this weekend and, and, and he couldn't make it. Hopefully we can find a way to get his uh, testimony in the record. I, I'm sure that uh, his family, I'm sure that, that farmers, ranchers, landowners along the pipeline route um, will be look back on this hearing to see uh, uh, with, with a lot of interest to see if Congress was willing to, uh, stand, is willing to stand up for their rights. Um, National Wildlife Federation first became engaged in the tar sands issue because Alberta's scorched earth tar sands operations are the most destructive source of oil on the planet. I personally traveled to Alberta last year to see these operations and I detailed the impacts in my testimony before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs on March 31st. In the course of our work, I've come to realize that there is a web of deception surrounding the KXL pipeline scheme that is unlike anything I have seen in my 20 years of experience. My parents taught me that when something sounds too good to be true, you better take a second look. The idea that big oil companies want to spend $13 billion on a pipeline in order to help Americans pay less at the pump sounds too good to be true because it's simply not true. The KXL pipeline scheme is a big oil wolf hiding in Canadian sheepskin. The risky and unnecessary KXL pipeline will raise gas prices, harm our energy security, and jeopardize some of America's most important clean water supplies. At a time when families are already hurting from spiking gas prices, oil companies want to build the KXL pipeline to increase U.S. gas prices by another 10 to 20 cents per gallon with the highest price spikes occurring in the Midwest states, the Congressman you mentioned. 
This KXL scheme is equivalent to a $4 billion a year tax on the oil we are already getting from Canada, with all the money going from American wallets and pocketbooks to oil companies. How do we know? We now have the company's own documents that spell it out. When making the case for the pipeline to the Canadian government, TransCanada argued that this pipeline would allow Canadian oil companies to increase prices for every barrel of oil that America is already getting from Canada. TransCanada estimated that the KXL pipeline would create a $4 billion annual windfall for Canadian oil companies at our expense. Mr. Burkhard mentioned that prices have gone up on world oil for $19 a barrel since the outbreak of violence in Libya. What hasn't been mentioned is that the price of Canadian oil has gone up $30 a barrel in that same time frame. That doesn't sound like our friendly Canadian neighbor. That sounds like the same old oil companies that won't let any global crisis go to waste. Piping Canadian oil across America does not make an American oil. The KXL pipeline scheme opens the Canada-China oil route that oil companies have long sought. The pipeline will take Canadian oil that is already flowing to America in the Midwest uh, refineries and instead send it to refineries on the Gulf Coast where they can export it. The data show that the KXL pipeline will do nothing to re reduce our reliance on oil from hostile nations. A study commissioned by the Department of Energy concluded that the pipeline, quote, would not of itself have any significant impact on U.S. oil imports. The State Department's latest impact assessment has concluded that the proposed project would not substantively influence the overall volume of crude oil transported to the U.S. or refined in the U.S. The oil companies behind this project are desperate for Congress and the administration to rush the approval of this pipeline scheme because the truth is finally coming to light. From the very beginning, TransCanada has misled the U.S. State Department about the purpose of this pipeline. By hiding the ball in its permit application, TransCanada itself is responsible for any delays going forward as the facts are investigated. The arbitrary deadline included in the discussion draft would, would reward TransCanada for failing to be as transparent and forthcoming here today and in its permit to the application to the U.S. government as they were with Canada in their application to the Canadian government. The arbitrary deadline could also prevent the consideration of safety findings from several recent catastrophic ruptures of tar sludge pipelines. These investigations are not complete. Even though tar sands sand supply only a small fraction of the oil we consume, the pipelines carrying tar sands account for over half of all crude oil spilled in the U.S. in 2010. According to EPA, the toxic tar sludge from another massive spill to the Kalamazoo River watershed has de in Michigan has defied cleanup efforts because the heavy tar sludge sunk quickly beyond the reach of skimmers. Residents are still dealing with the health impacts and thousands of great blue herons, geese, swans, and other wildlife have been killed. TransCanada's latest state-of-the-art pipeline, Keystone 1, has had 11 leaks in less than a year of operation. These recent spills are clear warnings that America's outdated pipeline safety laws are not prepared for highly corrosive and toxic star, uh, tar sludge, and I urge the committee to set aside the idea of an arbitrary deadline and instead take a more critical and independent look at what this pipeline scheme really means for gas prices, for energy security, and for America's clean water supplies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and be sure and turn your microphone on. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Murray Smith. I'm a former elected member of the Alberta Legislature. I served from 1993 to 2004. I served in various cabinet uh, portfolios, including the Minister of Energy for 2001 to 2004. And I served at the request of Alberta's Premier uh, as Alberta's first official diplomatic representative to the United States from 2005 to 2007. Today I serve on various boards in the energy sector, and it's a privilege to be here to discuss U.S. energy supply. Firstly, let me thank the United States for being Alberta's top customer for natural gas and crude oil for the last 50 years. Today's hearing recognizes the importance of North American energy and the pressing need for new infrastructure to ensure North America's resources are being, able, are being used to the advantage of consumers throughout the country. I also want to recognize the great contribution citizens of this country have made in developing a strong, vibrant, and responsible energy industry in Alberta. This 50-year relationship has built strong bonds between the two countries, 
and created wealth and prosperity for citizens on both sides of the 49th parallel. This energy relationship is deemed to be so important by the two countries that the North American Free Trade Agreement has a separate energy section that encompasses this relationship and ensures continued uninterrupted flow of energy into the U.S. from Canada. It is on this strong foundation that the opportunity to expand shipments with new pipelines has become a reality. Today, the U.S., while we hold this hearing, the U.S. will receive about 1.6 million barrels of oil from Alberta and about 2 million barrels in total from all of Canada. Canada is your largest non-domestic supplier of oil, providing over 9% of the total daily oil needs of this great country. Alberta is home to the third largest proven oil reserves in the world, totaling over 170 billion barrels. In context, Mr. Chairman, Alberta covers an area of 256,000 square miles, slightly smaller than the state of Texas, but producing about one and a half times the amount of oil that Texas produces. And we expect this production to increase over the next decade. Alberta's oil sands are an important component to the U.S. recovery program. Producing oil from Alberta's oil sands adds great economic value to the economy of the U.S., billions of dollars, thousands of jobs generated each year. 470-ton trucks called Caterpillar 797Bs are manufactured in Decatur, Illinois. Each truck sells for U.S. $5 million. The engines are made in Indiana and tires come from South Carolina. The shovels that fill these, vast, these large trucks and four scoops come from Bucyrus in Wisconsin, now owned by Caterpillar. Consulting and fabrication expertise for extraction and separation equipment comes from U.S. companies, one of whom just received a billion dollar contract for a new oil sands facility. Upgrades to refineries to process Alberta oil in the U.S. creates new jobs for construction workers, tradespeople, engineers, and steel manufacturers. These expansions will increase volumes of Alberta oil into major U.S. markets. Multiple studies have placed job creation in excess of 13,000. Clearly, Mr. Chairman, Alberta oil delivers more economic value per barrel than any other barrel of oil imported into the U.S and it arrives via underground pipelines in a safe, uninterrupted, secure supply 365 days a year. Unlike an oil tanker that can be traded many times and increase in price from time to shipment to arrival in the U.S., pipeline crude is a contracted at an initial strike price and leaves little or no room for price speculation through its journey to the destination terminal. Canada, and predominantly Alberta, has been the premier supplier of crude oil and refined products to the U.S., for the past eight years. We have helped replace declining U.S. production, reduced imports from Venezuela, reduced imports from non-continental oil supply. Oil and gas companies spend more money on environmental issues than any other sector in the Canadian economy. Companies continue every day to improve the efficiency, cost, and environmental sustainability of oil sand operations. Air quality in Fort McMurray exceeds that, that of Toronto 98% of the time and New York City 100% of the time. Carbon emissions from oil sands production differ only marginally from heavy oil production in Venezuela, Mexico, and the heavy oil of California. Mr. Chairman, the dynamic tension of environmental pressures and cost efficiency serve to reduce oil sands greenhouse gas emissions as proved by industry's record of reducing emissions annually. Personally, I serve on the board of two emerging technologies designed to reduce emissions and surface disturbance. NSOLV is a solvent-based technology that reduces greenhouse gas emissions by some 85% and uses no water in its in-situ oil sands extraction. Today, there's about a $15 spread between foreign oil imported from offshore sources, North Sea Brent, and West Texas Intermediate or oil priced in North America. If refineries in the Gulf Coast could refine Alberta crude, consumers could expect a savings at the pump from crude oil replacement of some million barrels a day. It also lessens the pressure on U.S. defense spending protecting vital oil supply lines across the world. In order to start this new cycle of U.S. job creation, increased oil supply, secure oil supply, and downward pressure on gas prices, a permit to construct Keystone should be initiated to start the process. The opportunity is now. In 2003, when the EIA recognized Alberta's 174 billion barrels of producible reserves, I was the Minister of Energy for the province. I knew this global recognition would create an avalanche of investment. In the past years, well over $40 billion has been invested. Today's oil sand investors include China, 
South Korea, Japan, Thailand, Norway, France, and U.S. private sector companies. A pipeline is in the permitting process to move Alberta crude to a port in Western Canada and from there to Asia. Once new markets are reached, the product will be forever lost to the U.S. If the U.S. delays, it will never recover the opportunity it stands to gain today by expanding pipeline infrastructure now. Canada and Alberta have stood shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. from World War I, World War II, and today as we meet, our troops are deployed in Afghanistan and fly together in Libya. We've fought together, we've died together, and now we can build together. We can build a stronger North America, a more secure North America, and a more prosperous North America. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And be sure and turn your microphone on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Rush, Ranking Member Waxman, and members of the committee, my name is Stephen Kelly. I am the Assistant General President of the United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, or the UA. We represent over 340,000 members employed in the plumbing and piping industry here and in Canada. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide testimony with regard to the Keystone XL project. In a word, the UA strongly supports this project and the draft legislation to expedite its approval. We have a number of reasons for supporting this. This is a mega project in the construction industry, and it's estimated that somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion will be injected into the U.S. economy. This project generates thousands of good, high-quality jobs, and this country desperately needs such work. This will produce other economic benefits, including economic stimulus in the affected states and cities and new tax revenues. At the same time, Keystone will increase our nation's long-term security by accessing oil from our friendly neighbors to the north and Canada. This project is financed solely from private dollars, and the benefits coming to the United States are at zero cost to the taxpayer. This project will generate somewhere in the neighborhood of 13,000 construction jobs. In a time of recession, the, con the construction industry is hit first and hardest. In the current climate, where we're facing nearly 20 percent unemployment, we also have pockets that exceed 40 percent unemployment. We need these jobs desperately. The 13,000 construction jobs mentioned are high-paying jobs that include health and welfare as well as pension benefits. These are the kinds of jobs that make America strong. Construction jobs are only the beginning. It's estimated that during the construction of the pipeline, there will be 7,000 manufacturing jobs which are associated with producing the raw material that's needed for the pipeline. It's also estimated that over 100,000 jobs that are related to the pipeline, whether it be design, construction, or operation, will be generated. In fact, according to a study released this month by the Canadian Energy Research Institute, the number of U.S. jobs associated with Canada's oil sands is expected to go from 21,000 as counted in the year 2010 to approximately 465,000 by 2035. There'll be a tremendous influx in personal income to the workers, and this helps to generate the tax revenue that's so desperately needed by our states and local governments. Experts project the U.S. will need oil and natural gas supplies to meet more than half of our nation's energy needs through 2035. The reality is that we have to pursue all available new and alternative energy sources, but we are going to be dependent on carbon fuels for the foreseeable future, and we need to procure them from the most reliable source. Keystone offers us a solid partnership with one of our closest and most trusted allies and provides reliable long-term supply of crude oil, absolutely essential to our energy security. Keystone provides a rare opportunity to reduce our dependence on unstable Middle Eastern oil reserves, and we can begin to insulate ourselves from the supply-side uncertainties that we are already facing, allowing us to build a more secure energy future. 
Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, I simply want to reiterate the fact that the UA or United Association fully endorses this project and the draft uh, legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, and thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, I, I would like to make just one comment. Uh, my friend, the gentleman from California, in his opening statement, made some references uh, to the Koch brothers, who we all know about. And uh, we all understand that in any kind of development project, certain people are going to benefit from that because of financial interest. I don't know if the Koch brothers have an interest in this project or not. I do know and have been told that George Soros has a strong interest in Suncor, the oil sands company that will directly benefit from this pipeline. And we know that Mr. Soros contributes huge amounts of money to moveon.org, whose purpose is to defeat Republicans, Tea Party members, and others. And I have no objection to that, except I would wish he wouldn't do it. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but I think that this is not about personalities. This is about a project and its benefit or lack of benefit to the American people. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and Mr. Simons, uh, I will tell you I'm a real fan of protecting wildlife. I've been involved in a lot of those uh, issues. Uh, I, you made some pretty strong statements in your testimony, and I'm going to ask the gentleman from Trans Canada to respond to it because in reading this, you say recently uncovered documents have revealed the true motivations for this pipeline, price manipulation. In seeking their Canadian permit, Trans Canada, Canada argued that the pipeline would allow oil, Canadian oil companies to increase prices for all the oil Canada is already selling the U.S. And they submitted a market analysis that would be a windfall uh, that the U.S. would hand over to Canadian oil com companies $4 billion annually. And then there are other people have made comments that it's going to increase prices of uh, oil products in the Midwest. Would you respond to that, Mr. Porbus? Porbi? I'd, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, I, I, I think right off the bat, it, it, it's important for people to understand that uh, the Keystone XL pipeline is a federally regulated pipeline. We charge a toll per barrel of throughput on our pipeline. We do not make one extra penny if the price of oil goes up or make less money uh, if the price goes down. I, 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 I think my friend in his testimony uh, is, is, make, is failing to make a distinction between the price of crude and the price of gasoline. And, uh, you know, what, what there is, we are not hiding anything. Our testimony was obviously public in front of our federal regulator. But it, it, is, it is without debate that right now there is a significant oversupply of pipeline capacity from Canada into the U.S. Midwest, into the Chicago market. That has resulted for the time being in a very significant discount for Canadian crude oil into that market. Uh, that is a situation that will not persist indefinitely. Producers will find a way to get to markets where they do not see a discount for their product. And as my friend Mr. Burkhart stated in his testimony, the price of gasoline is not tied directly to the price of crude oil. In the Midwest right now, as, uh, as, as Representative Rush mentioned, uh, Chicago gas prices are as high or higher than anywhere else in the country, and yet crude oil prices are lower than anywhere in the country. So while it is true that building Keystone XL pricing, or sorry, building the Keystone XL pipeline will likely reduce the very significant discount that Canadian producers receive for their crude, that crude will still remain the cheapest source of crude by a long shot that U.S. refineries have access to. And to give you an idea, today, Canadian crude regularly trades at a discount of 20 to $35 a barrel over OPEC-based supply. So I hope, that, I hope that gives some 
uh, color into uh, mm -hmm. into our, our twenty to thirty five dollars a barrel. Yes, Ms. Burkhardt, will you make any comment on this issue? Uh, yes, uh, this is a, a key point because uh, the core. Uh, message at least from us is more supply at a given level of supply at a given level of demand tends to lower prices uh, rather than raise prices and we have a pipeline system that has been constructed to deliver crude oil to the US Midwest not out of the Midwest so we've had this surge in supply that is stuck in the Midwest yet the Midwest needs to import gasoline from outside the Midwest therefore the gasoline they import from other parts of the U.S. is priced at a global level. So that's why there's a disconnect between the gasoline price in Chicago and the crude oil price. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rush, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Simon, this seems to me <clears throat> you seem to create quite a stir here uh, in the hearing, and uh, maybe you want to kind of respond to some of the uh, uh, characterizations of your testimony by uh, some of your colleagues uh, uh, at, at the table there. Is there, did you fail to distinguish between uh, crude oil prices and gasoline prices in your testimony? And what are some of the other uh, matters that you might have to, uh, to say about uh, these glorious comments from you? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I do agree on one thing. I agree that TransCanada isn't the company that uh, makes more money when prices go up. But the oil companies, the many oil companies, Bolero uh, and others, uh, will make a lot of money, and they are in partnership in helping push this pipeline through. And the document, and it's right here, that's the application, um, says very clearly, I mean, it's, a, it's only three, uh, three three paragraphs on crude pricing impact, and, and Congressman Waxman, you actually cited some of it, two to $3.9 billion in windfall profits to Canadian oil producers. Nothing in here about discounts in prices or any of the things that's in the testimony once they start coming down here to the United States and talking to unions and talking to others. A totally different story. The reason that we are focused on gas prices, uh, and the evidence of that comes from Dr. Philip uh, Ver Verlager, was a widely respected oil market economist. He started off in the uh, Ford administration on the, uh, as a senior economist uh, for the uh, Economic Council. Um, in a Star Tribune uh, article, he says very clearly that, uh, you, and I'll quote from it, that U.S. farmers who spend $12.4 billion on fuel in 2009, according to the Department of Agriculture, could see expenses rise to $15 billion or higher in 2012 or 2013 if the pipeline goes through. And he goes on, millions of Americans will spend 10 to 20 cents more per gallon for gasoline and diesel fuel as tribute to our friendly neighbors to the north. So I think we're focused on the right issues. Um, I don't think that the discount that's supposed for Canadian tar sands is real. The reason it's cheaper is because it's one of the dirtiest fuels on the planet and it's really expensive to refine it. So you've got to buy it cheaper to begin with. In fact, only certain refineries can handle it because it's so dirty. Mr. Mr. Poorboy, uh uh, Midwest gas prices, Chicago gas prices are exorbitant. My constituents are suffering. And I just want a simple answer to this question. Uh, how will this pipeline affect the uh, gas prices in the Midwest? Will they increase it or will they decrease it or have no effect. How will it affect it? Mm -hmm. it as, uh, as Mr. Simons referred to, there, there is a possibility that by building this pipeline, uh, Canadian crude oil producers will see a reduction in the discount that they presently receive for their oil. I think we testified it was a couple of dollars a barrel. Mr. Simons once again ignores that we're talking about the price of crude oil rather than the price of gasoline in the Chicago market. And, and as, as I said earlier, uh, the, price, the price of gasoline is actually not set in Chicago. It ten the price of gasoline tends to be set in the Gulf Coast. That is the largest refining center uh, in the market. And the refineries in the Gulf Coast 
typically are paying a global price for oil rather than that Midwest price of oil. Uh, so what I would expect to have happen, and, and it's something that was also mentioned by others in this testimony, our project will be delivering an incremental supply of 700,000 barrels a day of crude oil into the largest refining market in North America, the market that sets the price of gasoline for the United States. And it has been a, a long time since I took economics in college, but my experience on that was pretty clear. If you add a significant new supply to a static demand for a product in a market, you should see the price of that product go down. So it is my absolute expectation that over time, with incremental supplies of Canadian crude oil coming into the U.S. market, you will see downward pressure on refined products prices throughout uh, U.S. markets. So you, you can't, you, you can't uh, guarantee or assure my constituents that if this pipeline is approved, that their, the cost of their gasoline will not increase. I think it's, it, I, I, I wish I could, but, but uh, gasoline and, and crude oil, I mean, they're, they're, they're heavily traded commodities. I think an important point to remember is that the price of gasoline and indeed crude oil does not just depend on the supply demand, it also depends on the future expectation of supply and demand. And with what has been going on in the world, the price of crude oil has risen across the world because of the perception that it is becoming harder to, or, or secure supplies of oil are harder to come by. If we are to build Keystone XL and add a secure connection to the lar one of the largest supplies of crude oil on the planet, it would be my expectation that not just supply would increase, but the expectation of continued security would increase, and that would have a further impact. Uh, uh, moderating gasoline prices. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, before I recognize Mr. Terry, Mr. Simons, Simons you uh, referred to Randy Thompson, and without objection, we do have his statement. I'm going to enter it into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, uh, could I ask unanimous consent that the uh, uh, Philip Verlager uh, doc document be added to the record? Without objection. Mr. Terry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you started off with what I wanted to do, was get Mr. Thompson's testimony in the record. So, uh, Jeremy, thank you for bringing that up and sure. proud to. And uh, if you talk to him, pass on my condolences for uh, the passing of his mother. Thank you, and, and thank you for the help uh, in getting information, which is the key to the whole, the whole project at this point with him. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, but obviously, I think the, the discussion here on the prices and uh, the discussion about heavy crude and transportation and discounts is uh, a little convoluted for some of us uh, more lay people. It just seems to me that if we have 700,000 reliable, uh, is it uh, barrels? Yes. Uh, coming in. Uh, that that level of certainty, uh, consistency in a transportation system in a pipeline uh, would actually reduce price points, not increase. So I understand that uh, there's transportation discounts of heavy crude and those type of things, but overall, um, even the uh, CRS report, uh, the initial one from March 4th, 2011, not the one that uh, I had requested, uh, states on page 10 that crude oil prices are set in a global market, and they go through a discussion and say that uh, that this is not going to, there's just so many global pressures on the price points, as you said. Um, but I want to not ask the TransCanada, but uh, the gentleman uh, from Cambridge Research or HIS Cambridge Energy Research Associates. What's your take on the economics of the 700,000 barrels of oil coming into the United States? Is it going to cost more by transporting it through a pipeline? Is it going to impact gas prices negatively at the pump once it's refined? 
Well, that's, that's a, a good question. And by the way, you represent a, a great district, the district where I was born and raised. So thank you uh, for your service, Congressman Terry. You're welcome back any time. <laughs> uh, As a matter of fact, you could probably move the whole business back to on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I try and get back as often as I can. Uh, the price of gasoline in Chicago, in Omaha, in New York is set by the global market. And there are three, the, the price along the Gulf Coast, which is by far the most important refining market in the U.S., one of the three most important in the world, that's essentially the, main, the, the market benchmark where prices are set for gasoline, bringing more oil into that market from Canada, 700,000 barrels per day is a, is a large amount of oil. Again, just put that in context, that's more than half of what Libya exported, so it's significant. Bringing more supply to the global crude oil market at a given level of demand would tend to lower prices. There's a vast array of factors that shape the global crude oil market, but simply looking at basic economics, more supply at a given level of demand with lower prices, and that global crude oil price is the single most important determinant of the gasoline price in the Midwest right. or anywhere else in the United States. So just a, a, a lay economist like me, if you have a steady supply in a pipeline that's reliable, wouldn't that put less pressure on prices and they could actually fall? It's and you the, got about eight seconds. <laughs> <laughs> The, the anxiety about the reliability and adequacy of oil supplies around the world is a factor that has pushed up prices at times. So to the extent that supply is more secure, more reliable, that would be a downward force on price. I would have. Congressman? Now, uh, hold on. I, I okay. don't want to be rude, Jeremy, but I okay. do have 45 seconds to ask TransCanada. Uh, I wanted the State Department here. Did we request the State Department to, or DOE to be here? I'm sorry. Does he? Anyway, I'm going to ask. Does the state have you provided the State Department and the uh, respective agencies, including the states, the uh, documents and studies that are required? To uh, Mr. Poorboy, this uh, I, I I would certainly take the perspective that the review into the Keystone XL uh, project has been. Uh, exhaustive. You heard me talk about the the 90 public meetings, the hundreds of hours of testimony, the thousands of pages. I, I, I think it would be fair at this point with all of the work that went into the draft environmental impact statement and the supplemental draft environmental impact statement that the State Department would be in receipt of, it, of all the information they would require to make a decision on this presidential permit application. All right. One last question. I know I'm past my time, but... Uh, the next level of complaint from constituents uh, in Nebraska, or not particularly my district, is uh, what they perceive as kind of a brutal way of negotiations. So you don't have eminent domain, so you have to negotiate with landowners. Would you explain the process? And if we're getting complaints that they're not being treated fairly, that is a concern. Sure, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, right, right off the bat, I. I made the point earlier that we've been in this business for a very long time and absolutely one of our core beliefs is that we have to treat our land, we treat our landowners with respect and we treat them fairly. Um, this, this idea of eminent domain, we, we do actually have uh, utilities in, in Nebraska do have the ability uh, to seek condemnation of, of right of ways. TransCanada, uh, we have always viewed that as a last resort. Uh, and to, to give you an idea, on the base Keystone project, was a, which was a $6, six billion dollar project that went directly through Nebraska, we achieved voluntary easements with 99% of Nebraskans. Uh, and, and to give you an idea, to compare that uh, to the industry, on average, pipeline companies resort to eminent domain or condemnation proceedings in about 10% of the landowner situations they have. TransCanada's record is that we are only forced to do that in about 2% of, of okay. the situations. And, and, and I would tell well, you... And, and if we have a complaint, we got someone we can call. You ab absolutely do. And, and I, I, you know... I'm sorry, we have to move on. I might also say that we did invite the State Department and Department of Energy. Mr. Waxman, you recognize. Mr. Chairman, you invited them, and 
Do they refuse to come? I've been told that they declined. I see. Um, Mr. Porbe, y y your, your company has put the application in. The State Department's reviewing it. Uh, do you have a, a reason to believe that they are not going to give you a fair review? No, I, I, uh, as I said earlier, we, we have had a very exhaustive review, which I think is entirely appropriate given the magnitude of, of the project and, uh, and ensuring that, that people and stakeholders are heard in this process. I, I would Why do you think we should change our law? If they're reviewing your application, it's been exhaustive, they're trying to make a decision. I know you'd like to be approved as quickly as possible. Do you think you need a special law? And was Canada prepared to pass special laws for Americans when your government takes too long? Is well, you taking too long? Is that the problem? No, we, we've, we've certainly had no involvement in, in this, le this proposed legislation, sir. Uh, you haven't, okay. Uh, the question about the extra costs uh, uh, for the pipeline, uh, Mr. Si Simons, um, uh, we, we've already had unanimous consent to put in Philip uh, Verliger's uh, editorial from the Star Tribune, and he makes a case that we're going to be spending $5 billion extra uh, as a duty to Canadian oil companies f for this uh, project if this project goes through. Explain that to us because we see, you hear such contradictory statements to the contrary. Yeah, um, it's really not that complicated. The uh, oil companies want to make more money. They have a plan here. Uh, the, the whole supply issue is just everyone's working on a, a, a false assumption, um, a myth that's been uh, perpetuated that building a pipeline with a lot of pipeline capacity means you're gonna, going to get more oil. Uh, that's actually not what's happening here. This is all about taking the oil that's coming into the Midwest and moving it down to the Gulf Coast where they have access to China and other markets. Um, and once they have that access, they can charge a higher price to anyone for all their oil. Um, the, the theory that's being offered, I guess, is oil prices will go up, but gas prices won't. Um, I don't know if you believe that, but I don't think I would be able to bank on that uh, theory. What's really happening is as, as the CEO of Valero said recently, America is becoming the, the middleman in the oil, global oil business. We're importing lots of crude, we're refining it, and we're exporting more and more gasoline and refined diesel products uh, around the world. We're actually significantly increasing our exports from the Gulf Coast. And that's what they want to do. Gas prices will go up in 15 states, according to TransCanada's own analysis. Now, you indicated that uh, some of this uh, uh, this foreign owned refineries in the Gulf will simply ship the refined product to, Ca uh, to China. Right. So it doesn't really do much good for us, does it? No, I mean, this is, this is the gateway they, they've always wanted. I mean, these refineries, again, a pipeline taking Canadian oil to foreign owned refineries in the Gulf Coast doesn't make it our oil. We have a big expansion being funded by Saudi Arabia. We have declining um, oil coming into Sitco refinery owned by Chavez. These are the kind of owners that are going to be in control of this oil. Now this pipeline imposes other risks for America. The Ogallala Aquifer provides drinking water for two million people and is critical for farming and ranching across the state, several states. And TransCanada assures us their pipeline will be safe. How comfortable should folks be who depend on the aquifer for their, for their drinking water and their livelihood? Well, th this really w strikes close to home for a lot of people, but I've you know, having been down at the Gulf when, when deep water, just after a Deepwater Horizons explosion, we, we have to learn the lessons. We have to learn the lessons from the commission um, that said our technology got ahead of our regulatory oversight safety. That's exactly what's going on here again. Um, all the promises aside that we're hearing about safety and fail safe and, you know, on the second, I mean, just recently there was a keystone, the first, uh, the last pipeline that, that TransCanada built, and 21,000 gallons shot 60 feet into the air despite the, uh, the claims that they're making. This type of oil is more dangerous than conventional oil pipelines. We need updated safety regulations. And PHMSA and the administration actually need to do a better job of getting out in front of this right now. In his statement uh, submitted for the record, Randy Thompson, who's a Nebraskan farmer, uh, raised the concern that the pipeline could threaten, quote, the largest natural body of clean water in this hemisphere with contamination, end quote. He also stated, quote, TransCanada has bullied and intimidated American landowners with threats of eminent domain. 
Are Mr. Thompson's concerns unique, or do they reflect the concerns of many farmers and ranchers along the route of the proposed pipeline? Well, I have, I have a letter that's one of many um, letters here from TransCanada to landowners, and they say they're holding this, we're going to condemn your property in last resort. Now, I don't, right now, TransCanada does not have the right to, to use eminent domain and condemn property, but they are sending letters to landowners that say, if you don't sign this final offer, we will begin proceedings. We will be forced to invoke the power of eminent domain and will initiate condemnation proceedings. They are threatening American landowners. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to make a, a comment that uh, uh, the State Department has a responsibility to make a decision after consulting with other relevant federal agencies on whether this project is in the national interest and should get a permit. The last thing this committee should do is to set an artificial deadline and pressure the department into granting the permit. We will live with the consequences of this decision for decades or longer, and we should take the time to get it right. And furthermore, Mr. Chairman, I will discuss with you in a, uh, further uh, about uh, getting adequate information, whether it's from Mr. Soros or the Koch brothers or anyone else. We ought to get all the information that uh, is needed uh, for us to understand fully what are the consequences uh, upon which this hearing is based. I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scalise, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to try to bring the uh, questions I have back to what the, the focus I think most people in the country are concerned about, and that is lowering the price of gasoline and creating jobs. And, uh, you know, while it's been just kind of glossed over that, uh, but some people on the panel have implied that uh, this is just shifting oil from the Midwest to the Gulf Coast and no increase in supply, the, the numbers I've looked at show that you would have dramatic increase, over 700,000 barrels more of Canadian oil coming into the United States and uh, into refineries you know, along the Gulf Coast, uh, areas that I represent, uh, where, uh, where despite what some people think, they, they pay what the world price of oil is for the oil. Uh, to, to suggest that somehow mysteriously uh, they're going to have some deal where I'm going to convince you to pay even more than the spot price than you can get it for in other places just because it's from Canada. Uh, you know, I, I think maybe some people need to go back and take some basic economics courses uh, to understand supply and demand. And I want to ask you, Mr. Burkhart, about that question as we talk about uh, an increased supply coming into America, in this case roughly 700,000 barrels more coming in from Canada, uh, which hopefully would reduce uh, some of that oil that's being shipped in by tankers from places like Saudi Arabia, other Middle Eastern countries that don't like us, uh, where numbers I've seen over 70 percent of all the oil spills come from tankers, uh, surely not from pipelines. If you can address the question of uh, increased supply, uh, what that would do to price uh, both what the refineries would pay but also the price at the pump. This is uh, part of uh, very – thank you for the question, uh, uh, Congressman. And the, it, one of the issues about you know, is a pipeline needed, is there going to be too much supply? In the next couple of years, refineries in the U.S. Midwest will be saturated with uh, supply. So if, this, if the government, the U.S. government decides to enable greater access of Canadian supply, namely oil sands, to the rest of the country, uh, that would allow that oil to be delivered to refineries in Texas uh, and Louisiana, which are uh, the most sophisticated in the world. A lot of those refineries in Texas, Louisiana, they process uh, heavy crude oil. They've made very large investments to process that type of crude oil. A lot of the oil sands product that could come down from Canada is similar in its characteristics to that heavy crude oil. So there would be a, a, a uh, welcoming market uh, along, the, uh, along the Gulf Coast that could also back out uh, crude oils from other countries, also some important sources of supply. Mexico and Venezuela are struggling to maintain production, and they're two of the very largest heavy oil suppliers at the moment. You know, thank you. And, you know, I, I remember two years ago I went out to uh, Alaska, and, and we looked at, we, we went out to the, the North Slope. We also uh, went out to Section 1002 of ANWR, that tiny strip of ANWR uh, that uh, many of us are trying to get opened up where there are billions of known barrels of reserves and the federal government continues to shut off the supply. And Again, I'll, I'll just show a chart here tracking the price of gasoline since President Obama has been in office uh, and they continue to shut off more known uh, areas and reserves in the United States of America. Of course, Canada being a strong trading partner, uh, somebody who, if we're going to import oil, should be the first place we look uh, to 
to increase that production. Uh, I remember when we went out to the Alaskan pipeline and we were walking along the line and, uh, you know, harken back to all of those groups that came out against the Alaskan pipeline and, you know, and extolled all of the dangers and it was going to destroy the wildlife and it was going to kill the caribou population. Well, of course, I had video. I was taking a video. Uh, as we're walking along, caribou were literally walking up to the pipeline, literally yards away from us. Uh, and they talked about how the caribou populations tripled since they built the pipeline. Even all these groups were threatening, oh, it's going to make the caribou extinct. Their populations tripled because the caribou liked the warmth of the pipeline. Uh, so it's actually worked to the opposite of what, uh, what some of these radical groups have talked about. And, you know, and you're hearing some of the same things with, with this pipeline. Uh, but, but to the contrary, let's talk about the jobs and benefits. I want to ask Mr. Kelly, because in, in your testimony you talked about this, can you give an idea of just how many jobs you would expect to be created here in America? Uh, you know, forget about the, the, the benefits that, that Canada would see. In America, how many jobs would you expect to see and at what kind of wage would, would you expect uh, these, these Americans to be able to, uh, to find employment if this project moves forward? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, <clears throat> pipeline or mainline industry as it stands today has four crafts that are involved. You have the UA, the pipe fitters, teamsters, operating engineers that operate the equipment, and then members of the laborers union that uh, handle the ancillary work. Between those four crafts, uh, in discussions with TransCanada, uh, we estimate that somewhere around 13,000 U.S. construction jobs is what we're going to be looking at. There'll be additional work in Canada as the line moves towards the states. But overall, what we're looking for in the U.S. is about 13,000 construction jobs. You have an idea of the average pay? Um, it's going to run uh, with wages and fringe benefits uh, around $50 an hour. Wow. So and that's some pretty really good jobs that we could be getting here in America. Well, that's the kind of jobs we, we, we have to have. The um, pipeline industry or mainline industry in the U.S. has, has been quite successful. And uh, our pipeline local, uh, not last year, the year before, worked 12 million man hours on just pipeline. This line here is about uh, 1,600, a little over 1,600 miles long. It'll have somewhere in the neighborhood of a dozen pump stations. And so there's a great deal of construction work involved just in installing the line. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I have a, a statement I'd like to place into the record. Uh, and I do represent a district in East Harris County where we asked the State, uh, State Department to have a hearing. Uh, they didn't have one at the at the end of it in East Harris County, and we had testimony. Of course, we have five refineries, and they uh, two of those refineries I know do use heavier ore from both Pemex and uh, from Mexico, and um, and Petavesa from Lyondale. Mr. Buckhart, you talked about how ongoing advances in technology and operational experience have demonstrated that environmental concerns, particularly greenhouse gas emissions, are being addressed. Life cycle GH. G emissions for the average oil sands product actually imported from the United States are just 6 percent higher than those of the average crude oil consumed in the United States. How do the oil sands compare to the heavier crude currently being refined uh, from Venezuela and Mexico in our district? And the research I've seen is there's very little difference between the two, so we're already refining heavier crude. Is that correct? Yes, certainly on our analysis of 13 different studies about uh, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, the, those from the oil sands are comparable to a number of other crudes that are currently consumed in the United States. Certainly they're similar to the heavy crudes that we currently import. Well, and again, there's a price difference that most people don't understand. If you have heavier crude, it's less per barrel than maybe $112 a barrel that may be lighter sweet crude. Heavier crude is much less expensive because it takes it costs more to refine it. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why the refineries along the Gulf Coast have made these very significant investments so to enable them to process the heavy crudes because there is a, a lower price relative to the other. Well, I know at the Lindale refinery uh, in our district, they made a two billion dollar investment to be able to handle Venezuelan heavier crude, 
and but they didn't get any exemption from clean air standards because they're using heavier crude than they are light sweet in their refinery. They still have to comply with the same environmental laws that the refinery down the street, in our case, maybe down the road, would be uh, that's using lighter, uh, lighter crude. You don't know of any waivers they get by using heavier crude, the, the standard environmental protection. I'm, I'm not aware of any. Okay. Um, Mr. Porbo? Porbe, yes. Porbe, pardon me. You talk about how the pipeline application process date has already substantially exceeded the duration of the two most recent similar cross-border presidential permit applications. How long did it take to get these permit applications uh, approved? Uh, the, the two previous uh, applications that, are, that I referred to in my testimony uh, were our initial uh, base keystone and uh, a competitor a company of ours, Enbridge, uh, had a, a similar presidential permit uh, request for their clipper pipeline a couple of years ago. And in, in both those cases, uh, from start to finish, it was around 20 months. Okay. And this one's taken how long so, so far? We're, we're close to three years now. And... Uh, looking for a uh, decision towards the end of the year. Okay. So you, you would, your testimony is there should be some oversight because of the distinction between the time for the approval of these three. Sorry? Yeah. There should be some oversight by Congress because it's taken so long in this application compared to the previous two. Well, uh, you know, I, 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 we, we, really, we really haven't taken a public position on the, the proposed legislation. I think our, our, our perspective is, is that we have had a, a very comprehensive uh, process, review process on this permit, and uh, we, we, we take comfort that we are seeing increasing focus uh, for, to, to have a decision on this permit before the end of the year. And let me ask a question very quickly. Keystone agreed to comply with 57 additional conditions developed by PHMSA for the Keystone project, um, and yet Mr. Uh, Simons says that there's something about uh, this would operate under higher pressure using thinner steel than pipeline carrying less danger products. Um, is there any uh, validity to that? I have to admit I have pipelines everywhere in our district and I've lived along them my whole life. Uh, are they actually going to be able to use thinner steel? No. No, this pipeline uses a, a thickness of steel that is in common use for crude oil pipelines throughout the world. And it seems like if it's heavier crude, it would have less, uh, you know, um, it, it's harder to, to get it through the pipeline than it is lighter sweet crude. Well, d despite, despite the comments about the, this viscous tar sludge, I, I, can, I can provide assurances to the committee that the oil we're transporting uh, on this pipeline is not tarry, it is not sludge. It is uh, very liquid uh, crude oil. Mr. Chairman, I have additional uh, questions, but if I could, Mr. Kelly, thank you for being here. I was actually at your local pipe fitters on Friday in Houston, 211, and I work with the other local too. And, and believe me, every time I visit with them, they ask me about where this pipeline's at in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley is recognized five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Alex, yes. <laughs> I can't pronounce that last name. No one else can either. <laughs> the, uh, can you uh, uh, can you give me just uh, some insight if this pipeline, for whatever reason, is not uh, authorized and back? Are the oil sands uh, going to dry up and not come to the United States? Well, I I, I think Mr. Smith uh, uh, talked a little bit about what the options are for for oil sands production. I. I think one one thing that should should be made clear to everybody uh, uh, in this in this, this hearing is that uh, the the oil sands are a truly massive resource. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested both by domestic Canadian companies, a large amount by American companies, and and as Mr. Smith mentioned, uh, uh, an increasing investment by China, by Korea. Uh, and their national oil companies. And I, I think it, it would not be an exaggeration to state that the, the oil sands will, are really expected to be the engine of economic growth for Canada for the next 50 years. And so you're going to continue, you're going to continue producing them and shipping them someplace. Well, it, with the investment. That, I mean, that's really the bottom line. Is a, that's, a, ab absolutely. So that, therefore, therefore, I want to go to Mr. Simons, if you could, please. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I didn't pick up, I'm sorry, I, I missed who the author, you had some paper that you're referencing, right. some document that was saying uh, uh, gas prices would go up 10 to 20 cents? Yeah, uh, Dr. Philip uh, Verlager. Um, who's who's a uh, well-respected oil market economist? He has a newsletter. Who, uh, and history, and right? was he hired by someone to do this? No. He no, he does. He does an independent analysis. And no, he did, he just decided I'm going to write a paper, and and um, he wasn't hired by any group. Well, I, I can't speak for. I, I know he wasn't hired. Could you try to find I, out? I'm I, just I curious who paid that. for it because I don't think many well, scientists are going to just write a paper uh, without someone paying for it. So I'm just curious. Actually, oil companies pay for his analysis. Okay, so oil companies are saying if prices are if someone's getting... making money off this pipeline, someone's losing money. Okay, so, so now, um, do you know what his track record is in credibility in making these kinds of predictions? Can you, can you find out somehow to show yeah, absolutely. that the reason, the reason he has, his record is fairly accurate, that we can expect that, or is this a, a one-shot deal? No, the, the reason oil companies uh, and others in the I, market... I'd just like, if out. you could get back to me on Sorry. that, I'd, I'd like to see he that. was the first to actually figure out oil market derivatives. So, and, and the other thing you were saying, I find it curious, you seem to be, uh, you seem to be trying to prevent Canadian oil sands from going to China. You've said it several times. Um, is, is that a fair... Or did I mishear that? You don't... You didn't want it to go to China. Well, I think there's a whole web of deception saying that this is going to make us more secure when really they're trying to get it to China. And to but so, so we're willing to put potentially 20,000 jobs at risk because of a hypothesis you have or a theory you have that this could go to China. You're not willing to, you're not willing to see 20,000 Americans find jobs. Well, I'm just telling you what the data says. I thought this was an informational hearing. And what the Department of Energy well, and the Department they, We of ship State. coal uh, to China uh, every day. And it hasn't had that impact on, if you think shipping it to China is going to raise the price of oil in America, but we ship coal every day to China, and we're not seeing that increase attributed to the exporting of coal. I'm, I think it's a bit disingenuous in your argument. Um, well, and the other is that I've got to say, wouldn't it make more sense for, uh, for them to just simply build a pipeline over to Seattle than it would be? To take it 1,700 miles down to the Gulf Coast, if if they're trying, if if they have this clandestine study uh, to ship it to China, this is doesn't make sense. We we could debate all day, you know, where the oil should end up. But here's the thing: we have to remember the presidential permit is a green light for a foreign energy company to come take the rights of Americans to protect their land away from them. If there is not a national interest need, the president is what, what ordered happens, by, Mr. by Simon, Congress if, not I, to I hear you. That. What happens, Mr. Simon, if, if – do you have some kind of inside knowledge that the president's not going to approve this? Is, is, what happens if he approves it? I have no idea. Are you going to be just as outraged as you are now? I have – absolutely. No, we, we have been very clear with the administration. We oppose this pipeline. Um, do you have copies? Does anyone have copies of these draft conclusions? Do we have a sense of where they're going with the environmental impact? There's a, there is a uh, supplemental, dra draft supplemental environmental impact statement that now is available. Uh, and what, can you give us a short version because we're running over time here? Do you have a short version? Does it say this is going to be catastrophic and, and we can't afford to have the 20,000 jobs in America? W nope. what, what's the sense of what it's saying? It concludes that it won't help our energy. Well, the gentleman, you want just for uh, a moment? I, I'm just waiting to hear his answer, yeah. please. Uh, I said it concludes that it won't help America's energy security. We you yield just for a moment? I'm I'm sorry. Will you yield for would a moment? You, would you yield to him? Yeah, yeah I, I just want to, you know, the, the state, the, you, you mentioned a couple of things, and I, I think the, uh, the record should reflect that the State Department uh, is not here because uh, they are in the middle of the negotiations uh, and the review and all the other kind of activities that it was necessary for them uh, to, to um, contemplate and in order for them to make a decision. So they're, they're not here uh, at this hearing. I wish they were uh, because they uh, feel as though it would be inappropriate for them to be uh, uh, at a hearing when they are in the middle, middle of, the, of the negotiations. I take back and my time on the thing. I'm not at I'm, – I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, questions. I've got it back now. 
Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not demeaning the fact that they're not here. I'm just simply trying to find out where the which direction they were going in. That's all. That's Thank you. Big you question mark. Thank uh, you. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, Paul, Paul the, the, the specific question uh, that the rep representative asked, I, I believe, is: Has the Department of State indicated where they're going with on the environmental uh, draft environmental impact statement? And what I can tell you is that the first draft environmental impact statement delivered in April of 2010 stated as a conclusion that the construction and operation of the Keystone XL pipeline system would have limited environmental uh, repercussions uh, in the United States. The, they followed up with a supplemental draft environmental impact statement a month ago that reiterated that finding after reviewing significantly more information. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I might add also that uh, without objection, we accepted the documentation that Mr. Waxman asked us to introduce. We introduced into the record Mr. Thompson's testimony. And I'm asking unanimous consent that we introduce into the record the statement of Mark Ayers, who's president of the Building and Construction Trades Department, AFL CIO, who in his statement said, the Keystone Pipeline project has been subjected to 32 months of scrutiny through the National Environmental Policy Act, which includes review by 10 federal agencies, as well as numerous state and local agency reviews. The State Department, SDEIS, has concluded that the pipeline would have limited adverse environmental impact during construction and operation, and that it would significantly strengthen U.S. economic security. So you can put that in the record. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. if I might, I would also ask for unanimous consent, <coughs> consent to uh, enter into the record uh, a letter uh, that was sent uh, under the signature of Mr. Tim L. Irons, a senior land coordinator for the Trans-Canada Keystone Pipeline LP. And uh, this letter states uh, in the last paragraph, while we hope to acquire this property, through negotiation, if we are unable to do so, we will be forced to invoke the power of eminent domain and will initiate condemnation proceedings against this prop property promptly after the expiration of this one month period. Uh, in, in the event that we are forced to invoke the power of eminent domain, this letter and its contents are subject to Nebraska revised statute uh, 27. Uh, dash 408 and are not admissible to prove the existence or amount of liability. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to submit this in that it was testimony uh, that uh, the uh, company uh, TransCanada uh, does not have or have not been threatening people and does not have any legal right to enter into uh, the uh, eminent domain process for an American uh, landowner. Without objection. Uh, this is our first day back, and we didn't have quite as many members as we had hoped on this important subject. But I do want to give Mr. Smith and Mr. McFadden an opportunity of like three minutes if you all want to respond to anything you heard today, because I don't think a specific question went to you all. And I'm not saying you have to, but if you feel compelled to, We'd like to, I'll give you three minutes to respond to, or make some thank, comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be, I'll be exceedingly brief. Uh, because there are a few of us in this room who can remember the gas lineups of 1973 through 79, the shortage of oil supplies. Every day that the U.S. produces oil, you produce less oil. There's a, there is a immutable law that you have declining production. This replaces production that's declining. It gives you options about not having lineups at the gas pump. No matter what the price is, you won't have the lineups or it'll help ameliorate those. Uh, there's a pipeline being uh, in the permitting process that would go direct to China from Alberta, that would go across British Columbia. We wouldn't have to use anything here. Um, China's building refineries that are 700,000 barrels a day. Uh, they're serious, and I believe that we've got a trade relationship we can build on here that what I've heard today doesn't go back to the fact that, in fact, your supply has been interrupted, and this helps stop that interruption. Okay. It creates high-quality jobs, gives us an opportunity to build with common law, common property, 
um, right next door to each other, and I think that's valuable yeah. to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Ms. McFadden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just very briefly, I just want to uh, reiterate that uh, we're very proud of our regulatory construct in Alberta and can assure you that uh, the oil sands are be developing, uh, being developed in a very responsible manner uh, with respects to environmental protection, economic impacts, and the social impacts on our citizens. We live there, we work there, uh, we play there, and we're determined to keep it a great place to do all of those things. Thank okay. you. Well, thank all of you, and uh, that will conclude today's hearing, and uh, we appreciate your testimony very much and look forward to working with all of you. And the record will remain open for 10 days for any additional uh, documents. Thank you.